All right, well, let's uh, go ahead and get started. I think uh, for those of you who were at my talk yesterday, uh, this should be a slightly more relaxed pace. Um, we don't have quite as much ground to cover. Um, so uh, just a little bit about um, this statement. Uh, as I was working on this presentation, this came to mind because I think that if you were a share older in begin and end in C++ application code, uh, your shares are about to drop seriously when ranges appear. So it's a little bit of a funny play on words, which isn't making anybody at 2.30 in the afternoon laugh just yet. <laughs> okay, a um, couple words about my experience with ranges. Um, I uh, started working on this a while ago. Uh, I got very interested in it uh, as it was uh, coming. So a couple of years ago, uh, those of you who are in Aspen know we had a library in a week where we actually tried to uh, generate some examples, uh, example code for ranges, and that was because uh, there was frustratingly little documentation uh, in the version three um, implementation. Uh, so we had some pretty good success with that uh, and actually uh, managed to get some of that ported in. So if you go to the version 3, this is Eric Niebler's uh, range uh, implementation. If you go there, you'll see some of those examples in there. There's some others. I'll give you references at the end of the talk. Um, <clears throat> so uh, since that time, um, at the day job, uh, we actually put ranges in production, even though that's not recommended. Um, and um, I'll tell you a little bit more as we go along about what we've actually done with it. And also since that time, I've uh, participated in the library evolution and library working group in the standards committee, um, looking at the one ranges paper, which we'll talk about, and uh, working on it, uh, helping try and evaluate the wording and so forth as it went into the standards. So, uh, I've spent uh, a fair amount of quality time uh, reading this stuff. It doesn't mean I'm the world expert by any measure. Um, I take the perspective much more of an application programmer who's trying to use ranges. Um, so that's kind of the perspective you'll get in this talk. Okay. So this is how we sort now, right? Pretty straightforward, simple. Uh, we pass a begin iterator and end iterator, and it does what it needs to do. This is how you're going to sort with ranges. You're just going to pass this. This is all simple, very straightforward. A few less characters, although uh, there's a little bit of cheating in my calculation. So uh, we'll talk about that a little later. Excuse me? Depends on the length of A. Comment is it depends on the length of A. That's not a comment point. <laughs> I see. So the, the comment is that uh, if you made A much longer, then you would have to write it twice, and that's a very good point. Next time I'll, I'll write I, it I much longer. Plus, yeah. Mm -hmm. like, uh, if A is a computed function that gives you back an array, I've seen people write it twice and get back different arrays mm. and uh, an actual crash loop. Right, right. So the, the comment is that. Uh, um, there are real bugs that can occur if you have a function that's called there uh, and you're returning a function and you end up with two different arrays because you have to do it with two different actual um, two different actual be, uh, different actual begin and end. Okay, so obviously we've wanted to write it this way for a long time. It's just been an inconvenience that we haven't been able to do that. Here's another example. Uh, find if. So I've got a little lambda predicate here, and in the old way, again, I have begin end. And then in this case, because I'm getting an iterator back, I have to check the iterator and make sure. This code isn't really much different in ranges. It's pretty much the same. It's just that I'm going to use a range end here instead of uh, begin end. And I'm going to explain a little bit more as we go along about the namespaces and so forth. But I guess the real thing here is that even when you look at this code, we've still got kind of a lot of overhead for the way we're actually doing this. Um, 
And it turns out what ranges really gives you a simpler way uh, to express this uh, that's even more compact. So here's the ranges way with a filter view. And in this particular case, I've got the collection. I construct uh, a view with my lambda and I immediately can just iterate directly over it. So that's even cleaner, even clearer, uh, even simpler. Okay, I couldn't go 10 slides and not show you code. So let me tell you what I'm gonna talk about. Um, I'm definitely gonna show you a lot of range code today. Um, <clears throat> I have this idea that um, in a way it's hard to figure out sometimes how to program with something if you've never seen an example before. I think we all use examples as a way to figure out how to do things. Um, so hopefully you'll see a lot of range code today and it'll feel much more comfortable. Um, I, I think that there's no doubt that as we go forward, um, most of the code will start getting written with ranges and the SDL code will change just because of the simplicity and shortness. Um, <clears throat> and I don't think we're gonna see the full impact of this for a while because obviously what I'm gonna show you today and I'm gonna talk about a little bit today um, isn't necessarily that easy to utilize right this minute. Okay, so a few couple key points uh, that I wanna make sure that you walk away with. Views versus ranges and how to use them. And I will mention projections on algorithms, which is something brand new and totally new. I probably should have put on here, there's a couple of new algorithms and some new things um, that you'll see that are also part of the package. So uh, as I did yesterday, uh, some things I will and won't do. Um, I definitely will refer to the standard in a number of places here. Um, and I'm definitely, today we should have plenty of time uh, to take questions as we go along. Um, if I can't figure something out, then we'll defer it and take it offline. And as I mentioned yesterday, I'm a human being. Uh, I'm undoubtedly gonna get something wrong. I've tried to make this presentation as absolutely accurate as possible. Um, I'm gonna shorten uh, namespaces. And as far as the accuracy is concerned, part of this is I don't think I have anything in this presentation um, other than maybe snippets from the standard that uh, I didn't actually compile. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Specifically, the environments I'm using is Ubuntu Linux with a few different versions of GCC. So of course that limits you know, my knowledge of what might happen uh, on other platforms and other places. Um, and I'm typically using F concepts uh, that turned out to be actually a bit of an issue in some cases. And uh, typically the default here is the range V3 uh, beta one branch. I'll tell you a little bit more about what that is and where to get it. Or uh, uh, Casey Carter's uh, CMC STL2 uh, is the other option. All right, so since this is before C++20 is shipped, what is the status? And, and I think Yoda pretty much summed it up. Uh, uh, you're going to have to probably be a little bit patient um, or you're going to have to be willing to accept the fact that um, uh, you are going to run into some corner cases at the moment. So, okay, so let's talk a little bit about how we got here. Um, the one ranges proposal, that's the 898 paper, is the primary paper um, that influences C20. That paper was merged in 2018 after the San Diego meeting. Um, <clears throat> so when you go and look at the working draft today, you'll see uh, the results of that paper in the working draft. Uh, that was a four plus year effort uh, on the part of Eric and uh, Casey Carter in part. Um, so if you ever meet or talk to those guys, definitely give them some love for the work they've done. It's, it's a lot of work. <clears throat> and there's not, not everything in uh, C++20 is in those papers. Um, there's been a series of follow-on papers that uh, add additional algorithms, uh, bring things in sync with uh, other algorithm changes that were happening, and I'll talk about those a little bit today as well. Uh, there's some fixes and some cleanup. Um, so there's other things that are still in flight that aren't quite in the working paper. So as far as C++20 is concerned, we're basically design complete. 
um, which means that there will be more uh, papers uh, in the July meeting that's in Cologne. Um, and in that meeting, though, there will not be design changes. So there won't be new algorithms, new views, or any of that kind of thing coming into C20 uh, for ranges or anything else for that matter. The only case where will there'll be any design changes is if some kind of significant bug is found in the next year uh, before the final version of, of 20 ships. Um, and I mentioned the, the, the two reference implementations. Um, I said I expect the vendors to ship quickly uh, as time goes on. I'm not as confident of that after having some conversations this week. Uh, <laughs> so we'll see. Uh, I think uh, it's clear that on the GCC side, they're a little bit ahead of things uh, because they have concepts at least initially implemented. Um, and so that gives them a little bit leg up. And as you'll see, this is really predicated on concepts. Okay, so one day you're preparing a presentation for Aspen and you're writing some code and uh, this seems like straightforward and obvious code and it doesn't compile and it gives you a uh, weird error reference and you're like, oh, what's with that? So then you try out more compilers and you get no joy and then you say to yourself, hey, I know Godbolt has a whole ton of different options available to me. I'll just upload this little sample to Godbolt and this will no doubt work, right? No. <laughs> um, so the good news about Godbolt is Godbolt has online uh, various versions of both the reference implementations for ranges, so that's very handy. Uh, you can definitely try things out there. Um, but if you take that particular sample, which is linked there, uh, and you go there, you'll find out that it fails in the exact same way. Uh, so this is how I learned that the beta one branch was actually the branch I needed to be using uh, because when I submitted issues, uh, I got this response here. Um, and so this is not the only case of this happening to me uh, as I was preparing this presentation. It probably happened four or five times. Some were legitimate issues, some are uh, not. Um, and this isn't really a legitimate issue, but then also uh, Godbolt doesn't have the beta one branch just yet. And uh, somebody was telling me maybe how to make a pull request for this. So we'll see if I can get that to happen. So what about your other favorite reference, CPP reference? Okay, well, we've got that. Let's see if, does it actually work? I, I probably shouldn't try to go to that page, should I? I probably will screw up everything. I'll leave it alone. So if you go to that page, this is why I made a, a little bit of a snapshot. Um, you'll see that the documentation on ranges is for, relatively sketchy at this point. There's some good stuff there, um, but a lot is missing. Uh, and they have a code example on this page, and if you try and compile it, this is the error that you'll get. Uh, and that's because they're using Wanbox or some other technology that doesn't actually have access to the ranges uh, library at this point. So you're a little bit out on a limb here. Um, you have to be able to tolerate that some of the tools you might use on a regular basis aren't necessarily going to be helpful to you. Okay. So with that, let's talk a little bit more about the basics of ranges. So there's really four key things with ranges. Uh, there's the range itself, which is something that you can iterate over at its most fundamental level. Uh, we have algorithms, range algorithms, which are just algorithms that take ranges instead of iterators. We have views, which are a kind of range that's sort of cheap and lazy. Um, I mean, it's cheap to copy. That's what I meant to say anyway. And it's a little bit lazy. So it means it doesn't actually iterate immediately like an algorithm does, and we'll see that when we get there. And then we have range adapters, <coughs> which aren't necessarily such an obvious thing, but um, this is the facility that lets you make ranges into views and do uh, a lot of the nifty pipe operations and other things you might have seen uh, if you've ever seen any ranges code before. Yeah, so the question is, uh, uh, is there a specific kind of iteration that's required? Is it random access? 
And the answer is no, and we'll get to see that a little bit later. Um, you can have input ranges, output ranges, so um, you have the same kinds of things that you currently have with iterators, uh, and there's specializations of the range concepts for those things. So mechanically, um, we basically have a new header uh, in C++20, uh, the range is header, um, and we'll have uh, a new set of namespaces here. Um, one of the namespaces, the primary one, is ranges, so it's std colon colon ranges now, uh, and that's where all the algorithms and the view types are. And then you have the ranges views, and there's the adapters in there, and I'll show you kind of why that is. And then, you know, that's kind of long to type ranges view. So uh, you can actually just say std view uh, and, and get to the same place. So in this talk, um, you'll see a lot of code that shortens the whole thing down to RNG. Um, it's also in part because I have two different implementations that I'm working with and um, they actually have different namespaces uh, in their implementations. So, of course, you're asking yourself, why didn't we just put this in std colon colon? Um, and the answer is that these things, the range algorithms that we have, uh, aren't just drop-in compatible. Um, <clears throat> for a number of the, the different uh, algorithms, uh, the guarantees are changed. And so it would be very disconcerting if you were using an algorithm and suddenly its behavior changed. So for a backward compatibility point of view, it just wasn't uh, possible. It's not just that the overloads have changed, which they have in many cases. Um, and you'll see that there's some um, removal, well, I don't have an example of this, but there are in some cases uh, removed parameters, and so that makes signature compatibility very difficult. Okay, so I think there's a fair number of people who are unhappy with this particular uh, decision. Um, because it means that to get to algorithms now, you have to type std colon colon ranges, or you have to use have a using namespace uh, like RNG to get there, um, like you just used to type std colon colon. So, um, so it makes it longer, and that's a downside. But I, I think people will learn to live and adapt. So let's go back to that question of what's a range, um, and dig into it a little bit more deeply. Um, as we've talked about, it's an iterator pair. But one of the things that's a little different here now is that um, the end iterator doesn't have to be the same type. So in current STL algorithms, you have the same type, uh, but now we have a, an idea called a sentinel, which can be a different type. As long as it is uh, comparable to the iterator, um, that's the important thing. And that actually opens up some interesting possibilities for ranges uh, that weren't possible with STL, uh, including the idea of generated ranges or logically infinite ranges, which you might just take a sample of some part of the range instead of uh, actually iterating uh, the entire range. Um, so, you know, just as an example, in boost date time, there's actually um, a set of iterators that are not actually standard compliant, but they're iterators nonetheless that take a function and a start point, and when you iterate, iterate across that, um, you can iterate through, for example, you know, weak calculations or uh, other kinds of complicated calculations, and that's a sort of a generated range, uh, would naturally fit into that idea of a generated range. So of course, iterators with um, iterators, things that have iterators like collections, strings, all the sequence containers in general, of course, um, are going to qualify as ranges. So um, <clears throat> essentially, if, if there's a begin and an end, uh, it's going to be a range uh, because the begin and the end, of course, is going to give me an iterator back. So there's a lot of things, obviously, in the standard library today, array, vector, map, set, list, um, that all qualify in this case. Uh, interestingly, some of the container adapters are not going to qualify uh, because they don't have iteration. Some other things you might not think about will qualify, like uh, uh, file system directory iterator. 
um, some of the regex iterators, string view. And in C20, there's a new um, <clears throat> view type called span, which I'll go over a little bit. And um, that, um, that is also a range. So of course, uh, it's not just the, um, you know, the standard library we want to be able to use. We want to be able to use other things. And of course, because we're using began end, um, <clears throat> I can take something like uh, flat map from Boost, which is its own collection, of course, and it provides began end with compliant iterators, and it will work just fine with range code. So in this particular example, um, you see at the bottom there, after I've constructed the map and populated with a couple things, I basically reverse um, reversed it uh, and iterated over it, printing it out in reverse order. Yes? I guess if this fm would be a logically infinite thing, then I wouldn't be able to reverse it, right? Or something. So the comment is if it's a logically infinite thing, I shouldn't be able to reverse it, and I believe that would be the case, yes. Um, and sort would be, yes, that would be another one that would be a problem. And I believe, uh, you know, it'd be interesting to look at that and see, but I, I think that would be, that might be specified somehow um, uh, with respect to the concepts, because I think the sort might have to be uh, either a contiguous or a random access range, for example. And um, that kind of infinite range would not qualify. So this is Boost Flat Map. Um, just as an aside, for those of you who are not at my presentation yesterday, uh, there will be a standard flat map as well in C20 uh, that's a little different than, than Boost Flat Map, um, <clears throat> but that, um, uh, that would also work the same way, of course. So next we have uh, range algorithms. Um, they're very much exactly like the algorithms you know today. Um, and one of the interesting things about algorithms, if you uh, think about it, is that as soon as you call the algorithm, it immediately executes the uh, function. Uh, and the iteration over the range is controlled entirely by the algorithm. You don't have really any control over it once you've initiated uh, the algorithm. So as I mentioned, it's not a drop-in replacement. Uh, a couple different things. The return values in most cases, I think, have been changed. Um, uh, the Library Evolution Working Group um, was uh, working on trying not to remove useful information uh, from an algorithm when it could return. And I mentioned yesterday there was an example of uh, things like remove if and so forth from list and forward list, um, where the current STL was not providing like the count of things that were removed. Um, and in general, they've tried to um, uh, live to that principle of not removing useful information that the algorithm can, can provide without any additional cost. Okay, so I said views are, are ranges with lazy evaluation. Uh, there's a little deeper than that. They don't uh, own any of the elements. Um, so... If I go back a few slides here to this reverse view, um, this does not own any of the elements of the flat map here. Uh, it's just actually uh, looking at it at the range, uh, observing the range, if you will. And basically the copy and assignment are order one. It's essentially uh, something that you can do at a very quick level. The lazy part of it is that uh, the execution of uh, computation is not actually immediate. It can be deferred, so you can set up a series of views in sequence, and then you can actually trigger the execution yourself through the program. So again, if we go back quickly, you can see here, uh, there's an explicit for loop that I'm using to trigger the uh, walking through the actual range in the reverse view. And you'll see this some more too. Um, so that's a very fundamental difference, and that's why views and ranges, even though views are ranges, uh, have to be a little bit different. Yeah. If you mentioned non owning, if you go back two slides to that, to that one, uh, does that mean if, uh, it would be dangerous to replace FM there, like RNG reverse view FM, 
uh, if it was like a function that returned a map, if uh, instead of fn, it would be like call some function parentheses, and I would give that to reverse view, mm -hmm. that would be a bug. So yeah, so the comment is that uh, if I have a function uh, that I call that would create a, essentially would create a temporary collection, would, would that be a bug? I don't think it's going to be a bug because I think the lifetime will be okay. Uh, but we would have to do that <laughs> to be sure. Oh, we have a comment in the back. Okay, so the, the comment in the back is that there's an explicitly deleted uh, constructor for R value references. So in that case, uh, it, it might not compile. And that's actually a, a great thing to try out for the next version of this presentation. <laughs> yeah, over here. Uh, you say that all methods of ranges are, are order one. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, so, sorry, views. Uh, views, yeah. Yeah, so the question is in the filter view, um, do you need to compute? Well, the actual calling of the lambda or the, the predicate function, I mean, obviously it's going to have whatever runtime that predicate function has. So if it has to do 100,000 comparisons, you know. Um, but copy and assignment, for example, you can copy and assign views with no issue. That's the primary function that you're, you're getting there for, uh, for cheap. Yeah, more in the back. Yeah, He's going to help me here. <laughs> I think what the deal is is that the operations on the view itself are constant time. So I can, like, as you said, copy and assign the view. Yeah. But if I have, like, if I were filtering on primes, then as I start plus plusing my iterator, plus plus takes longer and longer and longer. Right. But I'm not plus plusing the view, I'm plus plusing the iterator. They never said anything about the operations on the iterators. Right. So the comment is the operations on the iterators might not be order one. Okay, so the, the, the comment in the back is that uh, it's likely that the begin is computed uh, right at, at the beginning, so that could be more expensive uh, depending on, uh, especially in the filter case, what it actually has to traverse in terms of the underlying range. Okay, well, good experiments to try. Uh, the question is, is there anything to not make them copy constructible? I don't think that, no, I, I think it's fine to copy them. So, and you'll actually see examples of that. Copy assign is fine. So you can send these around and that's kind of the nice part actually. Um, and the same thing kind of with span, right? Where it, um, you know, it, it's a sort of view, if you will, but it's not like the views that are in ranges. So span is a separate, separate thing from the, the ranges proposal, but. So like, I am repeating because if something is a reference, I'm not sure of it. Mm -hmm. Then a prime is necessary if it's not copyable. And then you use ampersand to make the total total. Like const ampersand, mm -hmm. uh, auto ampersand, ampersand. Mm -hmm. So the comment is, uh, he finds that if um, something is naturally a reference, you make it non-copyable. But I think the point here was to make uh, these views a semi-regular copyable type, which doesn't have any issues. So you, you can go back to passing by value. Okay, um, so let's go on. Um, range adapters. Um, um, range adapters um, uh, create views from ranges. 
And so there are, there are basically a utility to allow you to um, get access to a range as a view. And this is the thing that allows you to create the, the pipelines, the Unix or PowerShell type composition statements that you'll see. Um, <clears throat> these are declared in ranges view namespace. And we'll show some examples uh, later on of how this is actually utilized. So let's do one more filter view um, <clears throat> set of examples. And I wanna show you the same example three times actually. So I'm just gonna find, uh, I'm just gonna traverse through a range and throw, uh, throw out all the odd values here. So you'll notice in the first case here, I'm just constructing the filter view uh, on the stack like I would a normal object and I'm passing it the uh, uh, vector range and the lambda uh, predicate function, and then I iterate through um, and everything's good. I've already shown you an example of doing it this other way, which is you're basically putting the predicate right, or the, uh, you're the, putting the construction of the view right in, in the loop itself. Okay, so that's a second way to write it. That's the same constructor. It's not really any different. Here's a slightly different way. This is using the adapters I was just mentioning. So in this particular case, um, you can see that we're creating evens uh, on the stack with an adapter, and that's where we get this range view filter. And you'll notice here, it's only the predicate. It's actually getting the range of the vector uh, through the pipe operator there, and then the iteration is exactly the same. So what you'll find is, uh, there's a symmetry here of, uh, you know, uh, a case where you have ranges colon colon filter underscore view, and then you'll have ranges colon colon view underscore filter. And it just omits the actual range that it's going to take in that case uh, for the adapter. So you'll see that pattern over and over in the name. Yeah. Silly question. Do we have something like IOTA so that I don't have to type in all these numbers for my test program? You do, actually. <laughs> we'll get there. So the question is, do we have IOTA? And the answer is yes. <clears throat> okay. Yeah? I think there's a proposal somewhere to make the filter function like the filter that So you're saying on the right-hand side of, of that line right there in yes. the center? In the third line. Third line. So auto event on the right-hand side. Yeah. 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 It, it's, it's exactly the same thing as, as doing this, uh, except for that I, uh, it, it, it's literally exactly the same as this. You can do more times, and if you really want to, you can put ampersand after yeah. auto or double ampersand. Yeah, that's what I mean. So if, if that proposal for auto is approved, and then ranges have some kind of value type associated with them, like the vector itself or some list, then all these examples will have to change to something like so, okay, so I think, I think if I'm understanding the question, what you're talking about is you would actually like the type on the left-hand side to actually be, for example, a container that would receive the results. Yeah, so that, uh, that particular aspect of ranges, which is in the V3 um, version of ranges, and there's, it's, it's called ranges colon colon two, uh, that did not make it. And so that will not be in C20 uh, as of today. There was a paper in Kona for that and uh, it did not uh, garner enough support to do that. Um, as I think I'm gonna say later, I'm sure this is not the last set of ranges uh, facilities that you're going to get in the C++ standard. I'm sure there's going to be more as time goes on. All right. So, um, <clears throat> Just wanted to uh, mention briefly here that um, views and ranges aren't completely, or uh, views and range algorithms are not completely separate things. Uh, you can put them together and, and utilize them together. So this is an example of doing that. 
um, where instead of using the range for loop, in this case, I'm using the range for each. Of course, not every algorithm in you know, uh, ranges would be compatible with views depending on what it is. Uh, in this case, I'm using the drop while view, um, which basically says, uh, while the predicate is true, skip over it, don't uh, you know, drop it out. Okay, so collections are not views, but they are ranges. Um, <clears throat> I just pulled this out of the, out of the specification, range.view, um, so that the actual words in the standard would be clear. Um, so this actually is, is kind of helpful. It kind of gives a, a set of examples um, and it allows you to, to sort of consume exactly what, it, what it's saying. Okay. So I do have to bring up one controversial topic because I've already crossed over so many lines uh, with this particular thing um, <clears throat> that I, I thought I better mention it before John Kalb comes and hunts me down. Uh, so th there's some ideas floating around that we really shouldn't use for loops anymore and that everything should be pretty much like this, you know, thing I have over here where we should call for each as an algorithm instead. Um, but you're going to see uh, me write for loops all over the place. And I find it interesting that the standard committee, even in C++20, continue to improve the, the for uh, the range for loop um, if we weren't going to use ranges anymore or, or we're going to use fours anymore. Um, so I think uh, we can start that debate now. Unfortunately, John's not here to debate me right now, uh, but I'm going to use for loops uh, for the foreseeable future. And that was another bad joke in the afternoon. Yeah, the init statement is something new. So you can have an initialization statement uh, before the range declaration. And then it'll be only in the scope, scope of the four. Mm -hmm. Yep. So here's what the ranges sections look like. Um, not gonna spend too much time on this. I will mention things like uh, range.access. Um, if you're interested in making customized things uh, with ranges, there's customization points um, uh, in that, that particular section. Uh, the range requirements, uh, uh, you know, define much more precisely. And we'll see a little bit of this because we're going to talk a little bit about the range concepts uh, and so forth. Um, the adapters we've talked about are in the end and so forth. Um, there's actually uh, a lot of really good information in the standard for ranges um, because as we'll talk about later, uh, ranges being the first thing that's specified with concepts probably has the most precise specification of uh, any of the standard library that we have to date. All right, so let's dig into the algorithms in a little more detail. Um, and then maybe we'll do a little bit of a survey. Um, uh, there was an interesting talk I watched a, a while back that went through every single STL algorithm. I think it was in an hour, maybe an hour and a half. And uh, maybe we'll try that here with the range algorithms. We'll see, um, or maybe not. So uh, as I mentioned, they're going to be familiar. They're improved, specified with concepts. I think I said all that. So let's talk about projection parameters. Um, this is something that's new, and it allows uh, alternate form of uh, predicate filtering that's independent of what you would normally uh, be able to do. And th this really comes from Sean Parent and the Adobe source libraries, uh, if you're familiar, familiar with that library, um, and was actually in the very original uh, range proposals and there are a number of other papers that were submitted that do this. So what does it look like? Let's say I've got a structure like stuff here that has a couple of members. It has an IDX member and maybe I don't want to use the standard um, less than associated with the entire object itself but I want to only look at one field. In this particular case what I can do is I can uh, just put a predicate on that one field. So that's what I'm doing in the Lambda there. Uh, when I get back uh, III, I can just uh, uh, do less on the IDX member. So that's, that's what a projection is. Um, so that allows you to do some more sophisticated filtering, sorting uh, kinds of capabilities. All right, so here's the cheat sheet. 
uh, of all the algorithms in ranges, except for it won't fit on the slide. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so there's a lot. Um, it's pretty much all the STL algorithms and then a few new ones. Um, so you think we're gonna do them all? I don't think we're gonna do them all. So <laughs> let's go through a few examples uh, uh, and just let you take a look at uh, some range code. Okay, so here's, here's a few simple algorithms here for each on a string. Um, I have a lambda. Uh, all I'm doing is iterating through the string and put it, pushing it out. So I'm gonna put out hello. Uh, on the second one here, uh, I'm using the count algorithm to just count up how many things are a six. So that's uh, just like the STL algorithm. And on the bottom here, uh, we've got an is sorted question, which is a relatively recent algorithm in STL, um, but now you can just ask it uh, with a range. All right, here's that find if example again. I think I already told you how to do this better, um, so we won't dwell on that one. Um, <clears throat> here's, here's a different kind of sort, um, a couple different kinds of sorts, and Nothing, again, nothing exciting here, except for that on the second version here, I've, you know, given it a different predicate, just like you could with uh, an STL algorithm. Um, so if you dig deep into, you know, the, the specifications of these algorithms, you'll see that they're very much like uh, the STL. Um, what about the list example? You know, actually, uh, so the question is, um, uh, what's with the list example? And, and actually, it won't compile. So I was, uh, that, you're, you're a good straight man, and I'll tell you why in a second. Go ahead, back there. It, it won't compile because it, it, it doesn't have the ability to sort. Right, it, that's right, it does not have random access, yes. Uh, the question is, will uh, the ranges algorithms work with C style arrays? Uh, the answer I think is no. I have tried that, but I think if you wrap a span around it, that's all you need to do. Uh, and in fact, I believe I have a slide for that. Um, so here's uh, some min max type examples. Um, in this case, we're returning a value specifically from the algorithm in min max. Um, over here on the min-max case, um, I'm actually able to use structured bindings here, which is nice. Uh, so I get some really nice clean code for calling min-max. Um, what happened there? Uh, I think we have some slide right there. Um, <clears throat> Here's a copy of if example. Um, I've given you kind of the full headers here in this case. Um, but basically, we've got a couple of predicate, or we've got a couple of lambdas here. One's a predicate, one's actually doing something. Um, so I'm doing a range copy if with a back inserter um, uh, with that particular predicate. And so I'm actually making a copy into uh, a co another collection. Okay, so as mentioned, I'm not gonna survey every algorithm. Um, hopefully everybody here is familiar with the algorithms in general. You can go explore them yourself. Um, but let's talk about a couple of new ones. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's a couple new <coughs> algorithms called shift left and shift right. Uh, it turns out in, um, it, this one's a little bit unique in that we're actually getting, uh, this is an STL algorithm and a range algorithm. Um, I think the statement of the library evolution group is that from here on out, there won't be any changes in the STL algorithms themselves. They'll all be range algorithms from here on out. So uh, most of the future evolution will just be ranges. Um, so uh, this one's interesting. Um, it moves the elements a fixed amount, either to the right or left. Um, I guess depending on 
whether that makes sense in a sequence right or left, but I guess that, that's, that's some, some thought on it. So let's take a look at what it does. Um, <clears throat> if I have a vector uh, of five elements and I shift left by two, and in this case I've shown you the STL version of it, um, what happens is I get an iterator back that points at the fourth element there, so one past where the shift was, and the three, four, five has been shifted to where one, two, three was. But interestingly enough, the size of this um, has not changed. So in fact, if I just iterate directly over um, this container, uh, I'll actually get three, four, five, four, five uh, out of it. Yes. No, the end is past the five. It's not garbage. Yeah. So in this case, I call a race on the container with the iterator that I have an end, and then I can get three, four, five only. But if I don't call a race on it, then uh, I actually still have the original elements in it. Yeah. But is that guaranteed? Because like to the remove makes the elements into move from state. But in this case, I know for, for int it doesn't matter, but is it guaranteed that they are not moved? Yeah, so the, the question is, is it guaranteed that they're not moved from? And I think the answer is yes. Um, we probably should double check it to make sure. Maybe Arthur knows. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so the, uh, the, it's actually doing move. Okay, so, so that, yeah, so it's indeterminate then. Yeah. So I guess, Arthur, the thing I don't understand is why, uh, I guess it's, it's the equivalent of calling remove is what it is, right? It's just remove with a shift is what you're saying. Because the size of the container is still five. Yeah, it's like calling remove where your predicate just returns true twice and then false to the rest. Yeah. But that would be a weird predicate. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so there's the synopsis. I won't dwell on that. Um, I have a reference here. You can go look it up. Um, the the ranges version is not yet merged, um, but should be there hopefully after the Cologne meeting. So another new one um, that is also not yet in, but in flight, and we'll see if it makes it, uh, is find last. Uh, which if you look in Boost, it's called Find Backward. And if you look at every paper that's been submitted to the committee so far, it's called Find Backward. Um, and I, I covered this yesterday, um, but I think one of the interesting things is it's surprisingly hard with reverse iter iterators to find the last element and do some certain operations. So that was the motivation between this behind this algorithm. Uh, and I won't dwell too much on it. I'm just going to make you aware that that's a new algorithm that's in 20. And there's some references here. Uh, Zach Lean wrote this uh, proposal. So he's here at the conference. Uh, if you're interested in this, you can talk to him about it. OK, let's talk a little bit more about views and view adapters uh, details. Um, <clears throat> so if we go back to looking at the standard a little bit, in range.object.adapter, you'll find uh, this little uh, piece of information. And this was kind of what we were actually talking about before when I gave you that filter view example. Uh, you'll see that the adapters themselves, uh, either there's either the range with the arguments, there's the arguments with the range, or the range with the pipe and the adapter with only the args. And those three things are basically equivalent. And that's exactly the example that I gave you before. So, as I was saying before, the adapters allow you to make a range into a view, 
So here's a little bit more uh, sophisticated version of that. Um, <clears throat> so I've got a vector of int again, and I've got a couple of lambda functions. In the one case, I have a filtering lambda. In the other case, I have a transformation of lambda. Um, <clears throat> so I have a for loop up here where uh, I uh, have the, the, the range, which is the vector of int. Uh, and then through the adapters, I'm actually filtering and transforming the range. And then um, you'll see below there that I'm printing out what the results of that are. So um, <clears throat> it's filtered and squared uh, by the time it gets down to the for loop. So you get 0, 4, and 16. Now, <clears throat> you can demonstrate for yourself that um, these two things are, in fact, equivalent. Uh, if you write this code range is equal, which is the uh, uh, you know, algorithm equal, um, and you write that the two different ways. And so the first one is the piped collection version, if you will, and the other one is the parameter version. And indeed, those are actually exactly the same. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so the the common question was that it probably wouldn't compile if vecint was a temporary. Okay. So if I take these two expressions and I like use the is the same on them, then uh, their types are the same. Ah. So the question is, <clears throat> if I if I take these two expressions uh, and I use is same to see if they're the same type, will the types be the same? Hold on to that thought. We'll get there. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you a little bit of uh, what are the actual types that we're actually getting out of this thing in a few minutes. Okay. So another another point that's made in the standard here is this is sort of the precedence ordering. Um, uh, so um, these two things are equivalent. So it's more right to left and left to right uh, in this particular case. So. Let's do something uh, where we actually look at what's happening here. Because um, <clears throat> I'm kind of curious, right? I mean, I think we all think we know what this code is doing, right? Um, but let's, let's just confirm for ourselves that this is actually doing what we think it is. So now uh, I've beefed the lambdas and the functions up here a little bit so that they print out every single time um, they get executed. So we'll see if anybody's awake. Uh, the question is, uh, how many times does the transform execute and how many times does the for execute? Yeah, back here. Both of them six. Six, okay. Any others? Any other ideas? But yeah, so the, it's annotated there, uh, the transform and the four. So I hear a consensus of three, which is the correct answer. And the slide is actually wrong here uh, on the even. It is actually six times. That was zero based and math is not apparently my best subject. So uh, in this particular case though, uh, yeah, it's, exact, it's doing exactly what you're thinking it's doing, okay? Which is to say that it's short circuiting uh, when the filter, you know, does not actually uh, uh, return true, it never actually calls the transform, right? Which is what you would expect. Now, I will tell you that this is an area where you have to be a little bit cautious because um, it is not a guarantee that in all of these kind of cases, the iterator won't be dereferenced. And um, I'll actually give you a reference um, to some cases where people have been surprised uh, where they have a chain of filters like this where they get more dereferences than they expect. And that's by design. So, yes? Is there any mechanism that is already in the library or maybe a, a concession to the library where you have a series of transformations of filters and then you try to do some smart things with them, like you order them or you have anything to make them efficient? Yeah, so the question is, is there anything that uh, allows you to, to tell 
um, if it would be more efficient. Just as an example, obviously, this one would be less efficient if we put transform first, right? Um, <clears throat> because we would now call that transform, you know, six times, essentially, uh, before we filtered it out. Um, so the answer is, to my knowledge, there's nothing. Um, so, uh, yeah, you're going to have to evaluate that on your own. Okay. So back to your question earlier about what are we actually getting here for types under the hood? Um, because you know we're putting together a whole series of uh, you know these types, and it's a little opaque given that we're always writing auto something whatever and then just iterating over it. So it's all nice and good, but the real question is what's really going on? So <clears throat> this first slide here is just a little bit of. Uh, machinery that we're going to need to uh, do this. And if you've not seen this trick before, uh, you can go to the Stack Overflow link there. Uh, I've only shown you the GCC version of it because that's all I was using. Uh, there are versions for all the major compilers. But this just allows you to uh, do a little trick in some code um, where you can actually use the decal type uh, on the particular uh, object itself and print it out. So that's what I've done here. And you can see at the top, and by the way, I've cleaned this up just a little bit. I've taken some useless STD colon colons and other useless things out of it to make it fit and be a little more obvious. But um, <clears throat> the vector basic string of char, that makes perfect sense, right? That's exactly what we would expect for the vector at the top. So now when we put a join view um, around that vector and construct it, what do we get? Well we get join view of ref view, okay, interesting, uh, of vector of basic string of char. So the ref view um, is a bit of machinery that is being utilized by ranges um, to uh, turn your range, your collection, into an actual view. And the, the join view is the thing that's actually uh, gonna do the work, okay? So now at the bottom, now I construct a take view, uh, and that view is only going to give me a limited sample of these uh, items out. Uh, and when I get that, then I get what I expect, take view, around join view, around ref view, around basic string of char, vector of basic string of char. Okay, So we indeed are chaining up the type uh, construction here uh, when we're constructing views in this particular case. Uh, join view, yeah, so I haven't introduced join view yet, but you'll see some more samples of that in, in a couple minutes. All right, so let's, uh, so we got about 30 minutes left. I think we're doing okay on time, but um, we might need to speed up just a little bit. So a couple of view types um, that you should be aware of that are in the standard library, string view. Is there anybody in the room that is not familiar with string view? Okay, good. So, because we don't really have that much time, so it's a C++ 17 thing. It's a wrapper around string types. Um, it will play really nicely with ranges uh, as you're doing things. Um, so let's briefly talk about span. I did cover this yesterday, um, but I wanted to, to talk about it a little bit again today. Um, it's a non-owning view over a contiguous sequence of objects. Again, cheap to copy because it's really a pointer and a size and constant time complexity in header span uh, in 20. Const expert ready. Here's some examples of how to construct it. Um, <clears throat> it has constructors for uh, the contiguous range uh, collection types like vector array. Uh, and this was your question earlier. You'll see that bottom one, I've wrapped it around a C array. So um, kind of getting back to the question in the center of the room earlier, my opinion is that, that where this is really going to be valuable is in cases like this where uh, <clears throat> you want to you pass some sort of a range uh, to do something with it. Um, and you want to just be able to pass that by value cheaply. You know it's going to be easy to do. So in this case, I've constructed a vector event, and I've written this function called print reverse, which uses the reverse view, which you've seen about five times by now. And it just prints everything in reverse. You'll note that uh, when I, at the call point of print reverse, I just pass a collection, and the span is implicitly created, yeah. Can you 
the Spanish basically a pair of random access iterators or a pair of bidirectional bi iterators? I guess it's random access. So the question is, is a, is a pair of random access or uh, bidirectional iterators, it, it's going to be a random access iterator in a size, I think. So I, I, I think typically the span is a size, and you may know better than I do actually on that. Nope, okay. <laughs> um, so a couple more functions on span you'll see. Span is a big class with a lot of functions. You'll have to go look at it. Um, but in, in the case at the bottom there, I've actually subsetted the span uh, to the first two elements uh, before I passed it into print reverse, and then I uh, took the last two elements uh, uh, and subsetted the span. As I mentioned, there's a lot of a lot of basic accessors. It's a very collection-like interface, begin, end, um, and so forth. Um, so be aware of that type. Um, uh, in the reference section, I give you uh, a reference to uh, the current implementation that's out on GitHub that you can go use if you want. So the question is, does reverse view taking it by value, I uh, don't know what it's using there. I think it may just move it, but it it doesn't matter whether it does, it's cheap to copy. It's taking the span by value, but span is reference type, so there's no copying going on. I, I understand that, but it's no longer the main. Yeah, I, we'd have to look at the constructors to see. Yeah. My point is that you are making the effort to pass by value to re print reverse, but if reverse view doesn't take by value, then... Well, yeah, but reverse view could copy it or it could move it, it doesn't, it, yeah. Because it's by value, it doesn't really matter what it does, right? Yeah, my understanding is the first element is the same no matter what it does here, but inside, inside the reverse view object, it will have a span of int object that it got by copying SI. Sure. But that span will still just take one to the Okay, so the comment is that inside the reverse view, uh, it'll have a copy of SI, which makes sense. More, kind of, more questions. No, I was there. So, I mean, you, you do care, right, that it's not moved because you can use the same view more than once, right? The view itself doesn't get consumed by passing it along, right? So if we were to move SI, that would mean that, like... You couldn't use it. SI below in this yeah. function. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. All right, survey of views. So here's the cheat sheet for views. It's a little smaller. Uh, fortunately, than algorithms. Uh, I don't have an example of every single one of these, but I have an example of most of these. Um, so there was a question earlier about IOTA. So there's an IOTA algorithm, but there's also an IOTA view. Uh, so you can construct it like this and iterate over it. Um, in this set of uh, examples, by the way, I have um, actually given you the, the reference from the standard uh, about what the description of the view is. So for all of these, I think you have a short description, except for maybe one which isn't actually in the working paper yet. Um, so hopefully you'll find this a helpful reference uh, when you're looking at these uh, views later on. You won't have to go back to the standard 100 times like I had to do. Um, <clears throat> so take view, you've seen an example of this. This just takes uh, a, a fixed number of items from a range. A um, couple of simple examples there. Uh, the bottom example I put in just to demonstrate to you that, well, what if you try to take, you know, 10 elements out of a range that's only five wide? Well, that'll work just fine. Um, it, it will just iterate the entire range and, and then you'll be done. So we were talking about join view earlier. So here this, here's an example of join view with strings. Um, so it's going to compress them all together. Uh, interesting thing here is that you actually wind up with uh, chars. And actually, I should have uh, done my example of what the types actually turn out to be. Um, but you basically get uh, um, uh, chars to iterate over here. 
um, uh, instead of actually strings. So that's kind of an interesting side effect of this. So that's what a join view looks like. Um, if you do it with different, you can do it with different types, of course. Yeah, it's a flattening a flattening capability, okay. and, and split is the is the opposite, which I should have put right after join, but it's a couple slides down. Um, these next couple are are sort of uh, utility views, I guess maybe would be one way to look at it. So um, an empty view, of course, is an empty view; it has nothing in it. Uh, so if you look at the size. Uh, or you use the uh, empty algorithm from ranges to uh, interrogate it, you'll find out it's zero. Um, so in this particular case, you will never reach that uh, output. Um, so why might you want this? Well, you can imagine a case where maybe you're writing a function that's going to return a view of some sort, and there may be valid cases where the return value just needs to be empty. Um, so this would be a way to actually uh, create that. Single view is a similar sort of situation um, where you can put a single element into a view and then uh, you can iterate over it. So I've done it a couple different ways here, one with a string um, and uh, one with a uh, integer. So here's that uh, analog to join view, split view. Um, in this case, again, we've actually just used a, a, a std string, and uh, we've split on uh, the space. Um, and once again, uh, to really get this all the way out, I have to drop down the characters to do it. So one of the interesting questions for me is how this is going to play ultimately with uh, strings and, and other types um, when we start using these views. I haven't had enough time to really explore that fully. Um, I'd be very curious if you took something like boost string algorithms and tried to rewrite them entirely in terms of views. Um, I think that would be an interesting project for somebody to do. Reverse view, you've seen a ton of those. Uh, transform view. Um, transform view uh, is something that is going to apply a, a function uh, that allows you to change uh, the value. So, uh, you know, here I'm multiplying by 10. When I iterate over it, I get those results out. Uh, I think we saw a little bit of an example of drop while before. Uh, here we've piped it together, um, and uh, basically we drop while it's even, and then we take two of those and we get three and five out of this range. So, this is another example of how. Um, it's lazy, right, because uh, the object after leading evens is constructed there uh, and no calculation happens at that point, right? Uh, there's, there's nothing going on except for maybe the calculation of the end, yeah. Is it lazy to transform views? Like, so you get a function and put some computation on the value. Is it lazy in that it doesn't actually do that computation until you access the element? Yeah, so the question is, is, is transform view lazy as well? Uh, and unfortunately, th yeah, so this is actually a valid example. So uh, transform view here doesn't do any calculation at all until you drop into the for loop and you start actually processing through the range. Does that mean like if you iterated over it twice, would it possibly duplicate the function calls for each element? Uh, the, the question is if you iterate over it twi twice, would it duplicate the function call? And the answer is yes. Uh, let me get him first, sorry. Yeah, so the, the, the question is that uh, should it not take uh, uh, three and four. Well, I compiled and ran this code, so that's what it does. And and to be honest with you, when I was looking at this, I was like, yeah, I think it should be three and four. But I think the answer is that um, it's going to keep applying that predicate uh, across the entire range. It doesn't it doesn't stop applying it once you've uh, satisfied it. I. 
3 and 5 and 7, you take two of those, which is just 3 and 5. Yeah, it's a, it seems like the same as filter, but. Okay, so we got, uh, no, we had one over here. Oh, no, he's okay. All right, so I think behind, sorry, behind you, you were, you were going to say something. Yeah. Uh, um, I was follow up on his question. In general, can you use views twice? So the question is, in general, can you use views twice or do they burn themselves out? Yeah. And just in it's a it's a it's a really good question actually. Um, if if the state and maybe Arthur knows off the top of his head, but I think yeah, I think the state once you iterate it is going to be at the end, right? So you would have to reinitialize it. But if the view has the iterator state within it, then then you're not going to be able to reuse it. The iterator itself is walking over the view, but the view itself is of not knowing, like, I'm holding on to this thing. You can see my iterator, but if you ask for begin again, you get a new begin, but it's still at the beginning of its view. It should be fine. But again, All right. so, so we'll compile and run it. Um, I think uh, probably need to table questions on this one. Sure. Um, and we can. If we've got time at the end, we can come back to it and, and have some more discussion, but I'd like to get through the rest of the presenta presentation. Um, okay, so uh, next section is uh, a little bit of a uh, hint on range concepts, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of preview. We're not gonna go too deep, but um, just maybe to help you if you're actually taking a look at uh, the standard and, and how it's specified. So a little bit of an overview here. Um, uh, I said before, ranges is specified in terms of concepts. It's the first C++ standard library to do that. Um, the concept design was uh, finally hammered out after uh, a long, long period of time uh, in the Palo Alto meeting where a group of uh, uh, you know, the committee members and others got together to discuss how to do it. Uh, I've given you a link here to um, the result of that meeting, uh, which is 3351, um, and that really provides the base for the concepts uh, in the language in the library that's in C20. Um, when you're reading uh, the standard, what you'll see is that unlike uh, all of the other things like types, uh, concepts are actually in camel case uh, in the standard. So that's your clue that. Um, uh, that's actually a concept. Uh, and there's an entirely new section in the library for the concepts themselves, um, which you know is a whole nother talk, I'm sure, in and of itself. And actually, I believe I have some references. Uh, Andrew Sutton did a nice talk uh, on, on all the concepts uh, that are in C++20, which I encourage you to watch. Um, so in terms of ranges, uh, there's a few specific concepts. There's the range we've talked about extensively. Common range, which is an interesting variation on it. So we said that Sentinel and Iterator can be different now, but the common case actually is the collection with uh, iterators that are the same type, and that's called a common range. Uh, we also mentioned that there's input ranges and output ranges. So um, those that have exactly what you would expect is they operate with input, uh, input uh, iterators. And so algorithms that don't work with input iterators won't work on an input range. So there's a few more here. Um, a sized range uh, is a range that, because of the nature of it, knows its size in constant time. You also have random access ranges, which are random access iterators, and contiguous ranges, which are contiguous iterators. And that's kind of a new uh, concept, I think, uh, the contiguous iterator, or more recent um, thinking. We've always had the random access ranges, but the contiguous range is a more modern thing. So the question, so the question is, how is sized range checked? I'll show you a little bit. Um, basically, in concepts, you would you would specify the trait um, for the particular thing. Let me 
get a couple slides down and maybe uh, it'll kind of kind of be clearer. Um, <clears throat> so there's also view concepts, a couple of them. Uh, we mentioned before that a view is obviously a range. So if you look at the actual uh, uh, construction of the view concept, you'll see that it leverages the range concept itself. So you can chain together the, the concepts. Um, and it has the additional property that uh, the constant time move and assignment uh, and copy. And then there's a viewable range um, and uh, um, and it, it just says that oh, this is safe to be, uh, uh, this range is safe to be convertible to a view. So let's look at an, an example here specifically. Um, <clears throat> this is the definition of the filter view that we've looked at before. So you'll see there's a number of different concepts here. There's the first one uh, in the template parameter itself, the input range, capital V. And then there's the indirect unary predicate. That comes out of the base uh, set of, of uh, concepts. And then you'll see this other uh, syntax here, if you're not familiar with it, it says requires view, which is also a concept. And then it says, and is object V pred. So is object V uh, is not a concept, that's a type trait. And that's just saying that, um, you know, this has to be an object type. Yes? Oh, uh, the question is, what is the iterator T? That's another uh, type trait uh, that, that says that, that this is gonna be an iterator, uh, an iterator type. So on the second line here, what you see is um, the definition of the input range itself. So you see template and then input range, and <clears throat> you'll see that it's a range of T and an input iterator with an iterator of T. So this is the way these are specified. Uh, and as I said, the things in camel case are, are the concepts. And then finally, when we get down below, we have this concept view, uh, and you can see that relies on another concept, uh, several other concepts, two other concepts, range and semi-regular. Uh, and then there's this other little flag over here called enable view, and this kind of goes to your question before. You, the enable view, again, is not a concept. It's a helper trait that says, oh, this thing is actually, um, yeah, it's a range, but we've also told the system that this is a view um, because there isn't another way to necessarily distinguish between what's a view and what's a range. Okay. It, it requires it, the enable view to be true for it to actually uh, be detected as a view. That's how it's actually separated. So, okay, so I think we should probably move on so uh, we can get to the end here. We got about 10 minutes left. I'm gonna briefly talk about performance because I don't have anything um, scientific to say um, at this point in time. All I have is uh, anecdotal observation. So um, let's talk about two aspects of uh, performance. Um, the first one is, um, you know, what's the compile time like? And as I mentioned before, we've been using ranges in production for a while now, uh, mostly with algorithms. And we haven't really formally measured it, but I can tell you that there's a lot of other libraries that we use that expand the compile time uh, pretty dramatically, uh, whereas I don't really see uh, the stuff that we started using ranges code really change uh, observably. Um, <clears throat> that doesn't mean that's going to be the case everywhere and for every situation. Um, so the second question is, does ra ranges slow down the runtime? And again, um, I don't think we know the answers to this fully yet, obviously, because we don't really have a full system. But so far from... Uh, my anecdotal evidence is it hasn't made any difference. And I think from a theoretical point of view, it's sort of obviously not going to make much difference because really you're doing the same thing that the STL algorithms are already doing. You're just unpacking the begin and end in a slightly different location. Um, views may be more uh, interesting. And um, so, um, you know, I think on the one side, views might help you avoid write, uh, writing code that naively copies things. But on the other hand, 
there may be some traps there, um, uh, as we saw in chained, uh, in the case of chained views that, that might be a little more surprising than we know. Uh, I would also mention that there are things like boost range and string algorithms that are range based that have been around for a long time and, and they're very fast. Um, so dragons, uh, I kind of hear some rumblings that maybe the concept of GCC isn't the fastest thing in the world at this point. Obviously, it's a very early implementation, so uh, I don't know that we can really judge anything from that. Um, and I've, I've left you the references here to um, uh, the examples that were uh, going on in the bigger world. And I think my slide cut off here, but in any case, um, it, it's a case where you've uh, piped together several uh, views. And again, the behavior is a little surprising. Okay, that's the primary talk, but I have a few more things. I wanna give you a whole list of resources. So um, it might take me a day to get these slides up on uh, you know, up on the web, but um, uh, I think hopefully you'll find them useful. Um, so the reference implementations, uh, here's how you get them. Pretty straightforward. Ah, slide problems. Uh, range examples, um, you can see some examples in the range v3 uh, GitHub. Uh, I also have a GitHub uh, from the library in a week. Uh, it's a just a slight bit dated at this point because I haven't uh, gone through and adapted it uh, specifically for C++ 20. Uh, there's things in range v3 that are beyond what's in C++ 20, and I think some of the examples in there uh, are beyond that. Um, working papers. So um, <clears throat> the latest draft standard for 10, um, that's where a really good place to look at what's, uh, what's there. Uh, most of the things were uh, added by the one ranges proposal I discussed before. That paper is linked here. Um, the standard library concepts, there's actually a separate paper for that, uh, which Casey Carter and Eric Niebler also did uh, in 2018. That's the link there. And uh, the original ranges proposal from uh, uh, 2014, uh, is the 4128 link co-authored by Sean Parent and a num number of other folks. Uh, this next slide is the most recent working papers. Um, <clears throat> so uh, there's a series of things, as I mentioned, that are in flight. Um, move only views is one of them. Uh, the series of new algorithms, I think the shift algorithms, uh, but there's a whole series of other algorithms in the post Kona. Uh, uh, set there on 1243. And I think I mentioned the range two proposal that was rejected by LEWG. Um, but you can go take a look at that. Maybe that will get resurrected at some point. As I said, that is in the ranges V3 currently. Uh, here's some links to projections on algorithms, why they might be useful. Uh, Reddit, ASL, uh, Sean Parent's seasoning talk, Anybody not watch Sean Parent's seasoning talk? Uh, yeah, well, you should probably watch it if you haven't. Um, videos and blogs. Um, uh, there's a nice talk from this very conference by Eric, uh, really getting things kicked off um, with the effort to get to where we are today. Um, and he does things with ranges that are way more sophisticated than what I've presented you today. Um, and then Eric also has a CPPCon talk from uh, uh, 2015. Uh, Chris DeBala, who is uh, involved in uh, some of the uh, extensions to the ranges and some of the papers that I just give you, he wrote a nice blog post a little while back. Um, there's many more. Uh, and uh, so uh, there is a lot of information out there. One of the tricky things is the difference between what's actually in the standard and what's in the blogs and what's in uh, the actual world. Here I've tried to make it as close as I can possibly to what's going to be in 20 based on what's in the working paper and, and what's in, in uh, uh, the current implementations. Span resources, you can go look that up. A couple of observations. <clears throat> um, I think I mostly made this, um, but I think ranges is clearly the building block for the future. Uh, the code is much better and there's a last lame attempt at a joke because it's a begin not an end 
Uh, so um, thank you very much. So we have five minutes left, so we can go back, or do we want to just take a few general questions first and go back if we want? Yeah, so the question is, what about actions? And actions are not in the standard at this moment. Uh, I don't know the answer to whether or not uh, uh, that's going to be something that's going to come down the line or not. Uh, okay, first up here and then back here. So, so you're saying you didn't believe that you would see, maybe I was sort of, you didn't, you didn't foresee seeing the performance differences between like iterative versions and range versions of algorithms. Right. So I mean, but, I mean, one of the big opportunities here should be like, loop fusion should be a thing. Uh, so is that just, is there some, some reason I'm missing why that's not feasible or just, you know, no compiler by there's no like, we don't think we're gonna be able to get around to that particular optimization? Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the comment question is that uh, um, loop fusion might make it somehow that the range algorithms would be more performant. Um, you know, again, I, I feel like if you look under the hood of what's really going on there, it, it, it's all just calling began and end. Um, so I don't, you know, and I think, I think the compilers are demonstrably pretty good at unrolling that stuff today uh, in terms of like vectorizing the loop and that kind of thing I think that's a totally different a different matter so uh, you, you had a question in the back yeah um, yeah so why do you need spans if we have ranges why do we need spans if we have ranges well as mentioned um, uh, the requirements I think will not allow you to for example take that C array um, and, and just use range algorithm. In fact, I know for a fact that it doesn't compile, at least, uh, in the current implementations because I did try that out at some point. Um, and I believe that's going to be because uh, what it, well, I'm not exactly sure what it is that, that's causing that. Um, I, I'd have to think about it and look into it. Maybe, maybe Arthur knows off the top of his head again. Um, Oh, it doesn't have a begin and end. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't have a begin and end. But span does, yeah. So that's that's the problem with the C array. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. That's right. So the common end is that you could have a begin end uh, that's a free function. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Fine. I, I, I'm trying to wrap my head around the how would I use this because I don't think that I can wrap my head around the implementation. And I was wondering if I, if I have a set of numbers mm -hmm. and is there a magic incantation with the existing views that I say that I want to double every even number yeah. and keep in their position every odd number and change? Oh, so the question is, uh, can I double every even number and... Um, uh, keep keep the rest the same. Uh, in that case, you would have to be writing uh, back, and with views, that's not really going to be possible. Uh, you should be able to do that with the algorithms. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. So you could do a transform algorithm and write it but back you in. Have to, you have to put your if statement inside the transform. You can't somehow combine the filter. And the transform. So the question is, yeah, can you combine a filter and a transform? But I believe the transform algorithm will allow you to give a predicate. Um, so we would have to look to be sure, but I think you can do that. Arthur? I would think that either you would provide a transform the action, uh, or there you, go. you would have a filter view to say, I just want to view the even numbers. And then to that, you would apply the action double all of them. Right. So that you he wants to write back into the original sequence, so I think I think that. <laughs> yeah, but we don't have actions. <laughs> yeah, there's, so there's no way from you to mutate the array. I mean, there would be by design in, in the universe, right? Yeah. So uh, 
Yeah. Span span allows you to mutate things, uh, but I don't think through the ranges views you're going to be able to do it. So we have 13 seconds left. <laughs> we can go on for a little bit longer. Yeah. I'm, I'm surprised how bullish you are on the performance aspects of this. I mean, you're the one slide on that, but like, I've never seen it. Like, I've never seen Bethel manage to compile a ranges example. Like. <laughs> so the comment the comment is. Uh, I'm surprised on your bullishness of, of the of the ability. Um, well, I'm not ki quite sure. I, I mean, if you're doing Eric Niebler uh, scale uh, uh, ranges examples, yes, I, I concur you're not going to get it to compile. Uh, but I think it also comes back to what I was mentioning at the beginning, which is um, that the situation is there's a lot of elements in flight that are not compatible with each other at this point. So, you know, for example, I had another problem uh, I believe it was with filter view. So I had to use CMC STL2 for all the filter view code because uh, I think in the beta, uh, the beta branch uh, of ranges, there isn't the appropriate uh, CTAD to make things work the way you expect them to work based on what the standard says. So as a result, you know, it's in the one implementation, but it's not in the other <laughs> implementation. And so if you just go on Godbolt and you try and play, and you don't even have, as we were talking yesterday, we don't even have the beta one branch there at the moment. So uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a little bit uh, dicey. Um, from the production point of view for what we're doing now, like I said, most of what we ended up doing, I, I think we probably have two or three view cases where we actually used views. Almost everything else is algorithms. Um, in part, that's also a learning curve. Um, I don't know about how anybody else in this room feels, but it took me a little bit of time to wrap my head around the idea of how to use the views and actually get stuff to compile. Um, you know, I, I couldn't just write views right off the box. Now, hopefully, given that you've seen this presentation and these examples, it'll be a little easier. Um, but yeah, I mean, I gave that example of take view. It's like, this is the simplest possible view code you could write and it doesn't compile. So um, there was a definite case where I wanted to use a view in production code and I couldn't get it to compile with, of course, an older version of GCC and an even older version of uh, range v3. <laughs> so. When I say I couldn't get it to compile, I don't mean I got a compiler error. I mean I got a 10 second timeout. Okay, I see what you're saying, yeah. Well, that's yeah. what the timeout is. Yeah. If you're writing um, containers, should one worry about this or is that kind of in a minute? So the question is if you're writing containers, should you worry about this? And the answer is absolutely. You should provide the necessary begin ends um, uh, so that ranges will work and every one of your clients will be happy. Yep. Uh, I showed you the example of boost flat map, which is completely unmodified for ranges. It has no, no special changes in it for ranges at all. Right, but but like flat map's not going to have a a constant time size. Yeah, so the question is, will containers be constructible for ranges? We're, we're losing the room here. Um, and the answer is, that's what that range two capability was, is, is to be able to just say, you know, here I've got this, uh, you know, for example, a filtered view operation, and then I can say range two and construct a, a container from that, and it didn't quite make it. So um, you can do that in range v3. You can't do it in the standard for a little while. I'm sure it'll be rectified at some point. So um, there's other ways to do it, right? You can use a, an iterator inserter and so forth. Yes? So one thing now of writing in containers in terms of? Yeah. All right, I think we better call it. Thank you. <clears throat>